Welcome back. It's the Armchair Trader Podcast. Um, Happy New Year to our listeners because this is the first one we're putting out in 2024. And on the podcast today, we have Giga Metals and specifically CEO Mark Jarvis, who's joining us from Vancouver. Uh, Welcome to the show, Mark. Well, thanks very much, Stuart. Great to be here. Um, Giga Metals, um, obviously, um, it's a mining company. It's in in the nickel space. Um, But I was wondering if you could just give us a brief overview of the company and what you're up to there in Canada. Okay, well, we, uh, in conjunction with our partners, Mitsubishi Corp, um, uh, recently put out a pre-feasibility study uh, in September. And so uh, this is, you know, very high level document. Um, and it was interesting timing because we, we put the pre-feasibility study out and then the price of nickel proceeded to decline by about 50% fairly rapidly. Um, so that was unfortunate, but, um, you know, everybody in this space believes that that's a temporary occurrence. It's a, it's a bump in the road in, in what's structurally a bull market in nickel. So it uh, could be a very interesting uh, entry point for a lot of people. So nickel, for those who are not so familiar with the nickel market, um, who is using it? Who's actually consuming nickel and what's supporting those bull market characteristics that you've just mentioned? Well, I mean, the largest use historically for nickel and still is stainless steel. And so stainless steel uh, uh, growth tends to mirror uh, worldwide GDP growth. It's sort of like a barometer of worldwide GDP. And so that's, you know, that's that's normal. But what's new is that the rise of electric vehicles uh, has meant that there's a new source of demand for nickel that's much more rapidly growing. Um, and, and, you know, just for those of your listeners that don't know, uh, the part that nickel plays in the battery and the cathode is it's got uh, excellent energy density. So um, there is no other element that can compete with nickel for energy density. You can cram a lot of electrons into a small space and weight. And that's why it's critical uh, for range. If you want range, you have to have nickel in your chemistry. And in fact, just in the time, you know, since 2016, 17, I mean, uh, uh, nickel based chemistries have gone from one part nickel, one part cobalt, one part manganese, uh, or, you know, a slightly different chemistry substitutes, uh, aluminum for manganese, but one, one, one. And I think we're currently at 8.5 to one to one of the 8.5 being nickel. They have worked out how to cram more and more nickel into the cathode so that they can increase the range of the automobiles. And it's not trivial. It's, it's uh, <laughs> They're spending a lot of money to increase the amount of nickel in the cathodes. Um, you know, if you get that kind of energy density, it, it can tend to be volatile as well. And so there's chemical and engineering solutions to that. Um, and it's just, it's just amazing the way that's being transformed. But nickel has gone from 3% uh, of total demand five years ago to about 16% today. And the projections are that it'll grow to be 40% of uh, total nickel demand, you know, 10 years from now. So in terms of just setting the scene, you've got a situation here where obviously everyone wants to transition over to electric vehicles Mm -hmm. um and that's going to create an astronomical demand for nickel you've got a situation as well where the u.s industry wants to secure supplies of nickel that are close to home and where they have ready access to it and then you've got yourselves gigametals who have just put out a pre-feasibility study on on a potentially um quite a game changingly large resource in Canada. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. I mean, we, we modeled a 30 year mine life with 950 million tons of what are now classified as reserves. Um, but that 950,000, 950 million tons, um, is a subset of our resources. We've got a total of 1.5 billion tons measured plus indicated plus another 1.1 billion tons inferred. So, you know, we all believe 
uh, that, you know, a 30 year mine life is just the start. This is, this is going to be operating for many decades. It's going to be a multi-generational mine. And, uh, you know, aside from the resources we've got, the deposit is wide open. We think we've drilled maybe 20% of what's prospective within the ultramafic intrusive. So truly, truly a giant project that's going to deliver nickel for many, many decades. And so would it be fair to say that the market is currently underestimating the the scale of the opportunity here? Uh, I think that's uh, fair, Stuart. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, nickel is volatile, and this project is extremely levered to the nickel price. So, you know, as the price goes down, um, this is not a project that makes sense to build with nickel at current prices of about 750. Um, we used a base case of 975 a pound nickel in our pre-feasibility study, which was below the price of nickel when we published. But again, the price of nickel has just plummeted. But, but, but that price, our base case price is 19% below the 20 year average price of nickel in 2023 dollars. So, you know, that 975 is, you know, we thought a conservative price. It doesn't look conservative today. But again, I think the, the short term headwinds in nickel are largely caused by uh, overbuilding in uh, Indonesia. Um, and that, you know, the compound uh, annual growth rate for nickel for, for, for demand is 7.4%. That is a ferocious number. I think uh, the compound growth rate for copper is somewhere below 4%, and that's still an extremely healthy growth rate. Um, but, you know, 7.4%, you know, that doubles demand in, in uh, 10 years. So, uh, y y you know, that's, that just keeps on going. And if there's a temporary oversupply, the growth in demand will chew through that. And suddenly things will get tight again, and suddenly everybody will start panicking again. And and obviously a resource like this, I mean, it takes a while for something like this to come online. So it's not it's not like a an oil pump you can just turn the tap and hey, you know, there's the commodity. I mean, it's required to develop this. Yeah, that's a really good point. And and uh, our partners, Mitsubishi Corp, uh, and ourselves, and uh, the strategic investors that we're talking to for the next round of financing, all have a long view on nickel. And so, you know, if you gave me all the money today. I could be in production five years from now. So, you know, um, what's the price going to be five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? That's, that's what matters. The price today, you know, comes and goes, but it does affect the market. And I would argue that, uh, you know, if you've, if you've got patience, nobody can call timing. But if you've got patience, I mean, I think the key to successful investing is buy cheap, sell dear, and sometimes you have to wait a while. You, 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 know, you have to have some patience in this game. Yeah, that's a very good point you've made, actually, because one of the impressions I, I have had from talking to a lot of miners over the last five years and a lot of investors in mining companies is that the guys who, who really have made a lot of money in this sector are much more long-termist in their outlook. Um, a lot of people, a lot of the smaller investors, if you look at the investors here in the UK as well, you know they're looking for a sudden return. And if they're in a mining company and they've been in it for six months and they haven't seen a return, they get out. But but that's just the wrong way to approach something like, for example, Canadian nickel mining, where you're talking about at least a five year time horizon. Yeah, and 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 things can get very volatile in this business. I mean, we've been in a crushingly bad market for you know about a year, if not longer. Um, but, but things change, markets change. They go, if they're terrible, then they get good. If they're good, then they get terrible. I mean, it's just this endless cycle. Um, and you know, I myself am a punter. I, you know, I have a large portfolio of, you know, junior mining stocks. Um, you know, at this point I'd have to say, unfortunately, but you know, it, it, it really doesn't bother me. I have made a lot of money in my career by buying large positions in companies where I like the management, I like the project, you know, I think it's cheap, 
and I'll put away a lot of stock and then just forget about it. I typically hold from three to seven years. And then I find myself, suddenly something happens that I didn't see coming. And, you know, suddenly I've got an opportunity to sell it at 10 or 15 times what I paid. But it takes that patience, you know, rather than try and chase it when the events are happening, you accumulate when things are boring. That's the best way to go at it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what I do with my junior stock portfolio. I've also got a separate conservative portfolio and uh, there's a big moat between the two pools of capital. But um, <laughs> yeah. um, can you can you give us a little bit more detail on I'm talking about long term investing? Um, obviously, you've got uh, Mitsubishi Corp came on board as your JV partner uh, for Giga Metals. Can you give us a little bit more detail and background on on that deal and, and what they're doing? Okay, well, uh, first, to be clear with your audience, um, Mitsubishi is a giant company. It's, a, it's the largest company in uh, Japan. And, but we're not dealing with the car maker. A lot of people have that mis misconception. The car maker is a division of Mitsubishi Corp, but it's way over there, and they may never have heard of us. Um, we're dealing with the division of Mitsubishi Corp that is the largest commodities trader in Japan. Yeah, and, you know, they're sort of like the Glencore of Japan, if you will. Um, and, and what they like to do is get involved with mining projects at the development stage. And they've done this successfully many times. Uh, they'll get involved and they, they don't want to operate the mine. They want to have a you know, significant minority interest. So they like to be a partner uh, in the project of, you know, typically 20 to 25%. Um, and then they obviously get the offtake for their proportional part, and then their you know their traders can play with the offtake and make money with that, um, and 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 they may get more than their share of the offtake. It you know it just all depends who the partners are and what the marketing needs are. That's their methodology, and so they came across us. Well, we came to them. Um, our president Martin Vidra knew some uh, traders there because he used to sell uh, nickel and cobalt. Uh, to them uh, for an operator, Canadian operating uh, mine. Um, and they liked the project, so they took it over to their investment division. And that's where it all started. It took, uh, in, in total, it was a three-year process. <laughs> um, but even once they got serious, it was about an eight-month process where they went into deep due diligence. And they've got the capability uh, in-house of properly evaluating uh, you know, a mining project. And they also brought in a very conservative outside engineering firm uh, that went over this thing with a fine tooth comb. And, you know, basically everything that we said in our PEA, uh, the conclusion was that all of our assumptions were reasonable. You know, CapEx, OpEx, sustaining capital, geological model, um, you know, uh, recovery algorithm, all those things that matter to a sophisticated engineer, we, you know, nailed it as, as far as they were concerned. We weren't exaggerating. We weren't putting, you know, rose-colored glasses on this thing. We described it very accurately as, as what it is. So that builds trust. And what Mitsubishi wants to do now, and they're very active in this, is, is they want to bring in now a third partner. We're looking for someone to buy 20% interest in this project uh, from us for 50 million US dollars. That's, that's, that's the ask. That's what we're out shopping right now. And uh, Mitsubishi is being very, very helpful with that. When they introduce us to a very large company, <coughs> pardon me, I'm just getting over a bit of a cold, I think. Um, you know, we, we, we start the discussions at quite a high level within that company when we get introduced by Mitsubishi. So I just can't say enough about, you know, what a good partner they really are. No, that's fantastic. Fantastic to have, you know, a brand of that size and, and a firm of that scale invested in the business who's been over everything with a fine tooth comb. Um, and then there's also actively supporting you in, in, in finding an additional big scale investor in the project. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. 
And so that's how we want to proceed. Um, that is our model, is to uh, sell pieces of the project rather than sell stock. Just because the market is, uh, is mispricing our stock, we think, so badly that it makes no sense to uh, issue new stock from the Treasury just to raise money. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, is obviously another big hot button issue in the mining space, which is um, ESG and sustainable mining and making mining projects uh, that are less impactful on the planet. Um, you've been paying quite a lot of attention to that as well at Giga Metals. Um, can, you, can you provide a bit more detail on that and, and what you're hoping to achieve there? Sure. Well, for one thing, uh, our project is very low carbon uh, uh, intensity. Um, it's way down at the bottom of the scale in terms of worldwide nickel projects. But also we're in Canada. And so in terms of environmental, you know, you can't just get a permit to build a, a large project tomorrow. You have to go through a very rigorous environmental assessment. And so anything we produce is going to be of the highest caliber, uh, you know, environmentally and socially, we have to, uh, you know, uh, deal with the local communities and and respect the rights of the local First Nations. So all of that, um, you know, as as compared to Indonesia, which has come from almost nowhere to uh, they're the largest uh, exporter of nickel in the world now, and it's. Uh, the 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 growth rate there has been in, incredibly rapid, but the environmental degradation is remarkable, and that's a story that's getting more and more out there because it's the age of drones, it's the age of the internet. You can't hide these things anymore. You know they they they're strip mines and they strip down tropical rainforests mile after mile. Who knows how many species are being destroyed by this? They then process, uh, it, like it's a mixture of clay and dirt with nickel and cobalt in it. Very difficult to get it out. Um, and so they use high pressure, high temperature acid leach. They hit it very aggressively with sulfuric acid to get the nickel and cobalt into solution. Um, and then they're dumping their tailings, in many cases, dumping their tailings into the ocean. So, you know, and this is, this is an area of the world that's got some of the um, largest and most diverse coral reefs anywhere. It's called the Coral Triangle. Um, you know, and, and, and they've even got, uh, you know, like, like, you know, so they'll strip away a forest and then Indonesia is very rainy. And so you'll get rain and then you'll get these mudslides and engulfing villages and, and killing people. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. And then the safety record, uh, there just keeps being explosions, um, they, you know, it's not a culture of safety, put it that way. Uh, the, the, you know, they don't protect their workers. So um, the result of this, I mean, for example, we're in, you know, we're in discussions with a, with a European a premium brand uh, automaker. And they won't touch material from Indonesia. The last thing they need is to have their buyers boycott their cars because they're, you know, having dirty raw materials go into their EVs and their batteries. They're terrified of that, and rightfully so. Um, and so part of our discussion with them is uh, that they want guarantees that we will be IRMA compliant. This is a, a European standard for ESG. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to make, uh, guarantees to them that we will be IRMA compliant and we can easily be IRMA compliant where we are. So, you know, it does enter into the discussion. Yeah, no, I can imagine because it does, it does strike me that more and more people in the mining space are becoming more focused on this issue of who the end buyer is and the end buyer is getting more worried about how that commodity is being produced. So it's becoming a big issue. Yes, it is. And, uh, and it's quite interesting dealing with the automakers because um, I think they do perceive that in order to be competitive in electric vehicles 10 years from now, they better have, and it's particularly nickel and lithium, they better have their supplies tied up. Um, and so they do need to invest upstream. So it's, 
interesting because they don't know the mining business at all. It's completely different than anything they're used to, but they're having to learn about it quite rapidly. I was going to ask you, yes, is there evidence that they're educating themselves because they need to access these sources? Yes, there is. And uh, um, in some cases, in fact, um, you've got car companies that have put whole mining teams together, you know, mining engineers, metallurgists, and geologists. It's not enough to just have a geologist uh, evaluate a pro project. You know, you really do need to look at the metallurgy and the engineering of it. And, um, you know, it's a multidisciplinary uh, discipline. And, um, you know, so, so, so some of them are putting mining teams together. Some of them aren't there yet. But with all of them, it's very helpful that we've got Mitsubishi as a partner already because everybody knows that they know what they're looking at. And so, in a sense, the due diligence is already done. Yeah, yeah. And, and I suppose from their point of view, you can also understand it because car company that can actually secure a access to something like nickel or a battery maker that can access nickel directly rather than having to go through middlemen or the market or what have you, they can actually have a potentially cheaper supply of nickel than, than someone else who's further down downstream. Absolutely. And, and it's more predictable as well. So one of the strengths of uh, our project is that, you know, whatever the operating cost will be, they're going to be quite steady over long periods of time because we're not dependent on, you know, we're going to be linked in with the BC Hydro grid. So our power supply will be under long-term contracts. And, you know, that'll be a known number, you know, as opposed to relying on coal or hydrocarbons where the prices swing around quite violently your your cost of operation can go up and down you know along with the the price of the underlying power commodity um you know and also uh we're not exposed to you know with these hpal projects they're exposed to the price of sulfur and sulfur can be quite uh volatile it's been from just in the last couple of years that i've been following it you know from $50 a ton to $600 a ton down to $150 a ton and every $100 a ton difference in the price of uh, sulfur our engineer has worked out that it uh, uh, it affects the operating cost of an HPL project by 50 cents a pound of nickel so you know uh, it's 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 really a strength for our project that the operating cost will be so um, flat over long periods of time so you can you know if 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 a car company is a partner in the project they will get their nickel at our cost of production and that's something that they can predict out for many years um, my final question for you was really more around the the um the regulatory perspective in north america and here i'm talking more about the the U.S. Um, Inflation Reduction Act and uh, Canada's own critical metal strategy. Here we have a situation where, like many other governments around the world, uh, the U.S. is uh, seeking to secure these supplies of what they consider to be important um, new raw materials, which they'll require for things like the electric transition. Um, from your perspective, obviously, with, with um, quite a valuable strategic resource there, um, how do you think that's going to affect the prospects for gigametals and gigametals fitting into that, specifically that North American supply chain and, and that framework that's now emerging for miners like yourselves? Well, it's absolutely uh, put the wind in our sails. Um, you know, the IRA Act, uh, we, you know, Canada is a free trade partner with the U.S. And... So it's not just the U.S. government, but the Canadian government very much wants to develop the whole supply chain for batteries. Canada would love to be the main supplier of the gigafactory business in the United States. And that means developing nickel mines, lithium mines, you know, everything. We already pr produce quite a bit of copper. Um, but if you want nickel and you want it uh, in an environmentally friendly jurisdiction um, and you want it close, and you want it from a friend, <laughs> um, you know, you know, the U.S. companies are looking towards, uh, you know, Canadian uh, producers. And so, uh, but 
but as a corollary of that, you know, getting a project permitted, I mean, we've got to go through an environmental assessment and we've already obviously taken a look at things. I, you know, you don't see any showstoppers uh, at all. Um, uh, but, you know, that's why you go through the process. Maybe there's something that comes up that we're not aware of. Um, but at the end of the day, permitting is politics. And, you know, um, it's possible to have anti-mining governments. Um, but, you know, I think as long as you are, uh, you know, mitigating your environmental impact as best you can and you're not posing a real danger to the environment, and you're producing jobs for the local people and, you know, producing wealth for the, you know, First Nations that are involved, um, you know, Canada wants critical minerals uh, to be um, developed in Canada. And, and, and they've even got, um, you know, for example, and this is just one thing, uh, they've got a $1.5 billion fund uh, that's dedicated to uh, infrastructure to support the development of critical minerals projects. And we've got, you know, we've got a power line that we need to build. This infrastructure fund, uh, the way the Minister of Natural Resources put it, is for, is for power lines and roads. That's the infrastructure that we need. So lines and roads. And uh, we're, we're, you know, very hopeful that we can access some of that money. Um, or, you know, I think our project ticks every box for that. So we're in a very supportive environment. And as long as there's no showstoppers in the environmental study, I think that we can have a relatively quick permitting process. I'm, I'm conscious of your, your voice and the fact that you're still in recovery mode. So uh, just finally, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, what's your priority for the company this year um, for 2024? Well, the first priority is getting that next investor in. Because really, without uh, a substantial chunk of money, um, there's nothing really meaningful to be done with this project until you're, you know, until you've got enough money to do something meaningful. So that is where all of our efforts are being bent. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mark, for coming on, on the podcast this evening, uh, well, this morning, your time and, and giving us an update on Giga Metal. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Stuart. It's been a pleasure to be here. You've been listening to the Armchair Trader podcast. Make sure you visit our website, www.thearmchairtrader.com, for your daily dose of financial markets news and sign up to our free newsletter there.